What are the uprights between which the ball has got to go for him to be the genuine Jesus? Where are the goalposts? Where are the gateposts between which God with us has to glide? And does Jesus fit there? What am I getting at? It's been Christmas, so some of these things are a bit more familiar to us, but let's just run through a few of them. Here's one of the gateposts of the Messiah, Isaiah 7, 14. Prophesied 700 years at least before Jesus. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with a child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And quite interestingly, some of the atheistic comedians that populate our television screens have been ranting about this this Christmas and mocking at it. This is, this is how atheism is proceeding at the moment. They've lost a lot of the intellectual arguments in, in that sort of intellectual world. And what's happening is therefore that the comedians are taking over and making mockery. And uh, <clears throat> that's just what's happening in our world at the moment. And, and they pick this up and they say, oh, it's parthenogenesis. There's a natural process in the natural world where from time to time, very rarely, you know, a virgin will conceive and bear a child. The interesting thing about that is that biologically that's only possible if you're dealing with a girl baby. Biologically it's not possible for that to be a boy. And here we have Jesus being born of a virgin, a son. And more than that, he'll be called God with us. Emmanuel. Here's the first gate post and Jesus slides through. Micah 5 2. Little town at the back end of the hill country of Judea, Bethlehem Ephrathah. Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be a ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. 700 years before, it's minor prophet, Micah 5, and here's Jesus being born in Bethlehem in Judea. Slides through that gatepost. Isaiah 9, familiar with this reading around Christmas time? There will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future he will honour Galilee of the Gentiles. Galilee. By the way of the sea along the Jordan, the people walking in darkness, because you know, people living in Galilee were the sort of spiritual outcasts when Jesus was born. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And where's Jesus coming from? He's coming from Galilee, slips through another gatepost. It gets better. It's too small a thing, Isaiah 49, 6. It's too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I've kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. And here comes Jesus, casting out demons in the Decapolis, people flooding to hear him in the pagan cities across the other side of the Jordan. And then committing to his followers who will come after him the task of taking the good news about Jesus to the peoples at the ends of the earth. Slides through another of the gateposts of the Messiah. Does Jesus come through the gate or does he try and jump over the wall? He comes through the gate, he's the real deal. He fulfills these prophecies that go back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. He's written down with detailed foretellings of his coming. He's the real shepherd. Genuine Jesus. Isaiah 35, Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. 700 years before Jesus in Isaiah 35. And here in Luke 7, John the Baptist, well opens the gate for Jesus if you like. Locked up in jail, things not going well, on a bad day, perhaps he had a cold like this thing we're fighting off here today. And he's feeling low about it. And he sends his disciples to Jesus to say, you're not quite fitting what I thought you were going to be like. Are you, are you the one Are you the one who was to come, or, or should we expect another? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, Luke 7. Sicknesses and evil spirits and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and good news is preached to the poor. Do I fit, says Jesus? Yes, he's entering through the gate, Jesus. He's the one. And then Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. 
He sent me to bind up the broken hearts, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all the more, and so on. 700 years before Jesus in Isaiah 61. And Jesus goes up to the synagogue in Nazareth as he preaches his first sermon in his hometown in Luke chapter 4. And he opens the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and he reads from that place. And in the view of people who've seen and heard all that he's been doing, he says, there you go. This day, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Is this Jesus, the shepherd, the genuine shepherd who's given the entrance by the gate? Yes, because the gatekeeper opens them. The gatekeeper of all those Old Testament scriptures who pointed forward to him described what he'd be like. This is not one of those pretenders who are leading people off into the desert with the promise of a few tricks to show them something. To become their followers and lead an armed insurrection in their own interests. This is genuine Jesus. He fits through the gateposts and enters into the sheepfold. He is the Messiah. He is the shepherd of the sheep. Zechariah 11. Here's an interesting one. 500 years before Jesus. I told them, if you think it best, give me my pay, but if not, keep it. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the handsome price at which they priced me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. What's this about? Matthew 27. When Judas, who betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse, returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and the elders, the blood money for which he betrayed Jesus. I've simply said I betrayed him of blood. What is that to us? They replied, that's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. And the chief priest picked up the coins and said, it's against the law to put this into the treasury since it's blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. And took the silver, 30 silver coins, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field. One last one in Psalm 22. Psalm 22. You forget that some of the Psalms are prophetic, don't they? Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me, roaring lions, tearing their prey, open their wild mouths wide against me. Think of Jesus being mocked, hanging on the cross. I'm poured out like water, all my bones are out of joint. Think of what happened to him as they raise his body up and that's the cross dropped him or sucked it in the ground as they had him to crucify him. My heart has turned to wax, it's melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a pot, so my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. They lay me in the dust of death, and they bring him a drink for him, or a weed. Dogs have surrounded me, a band of evil men has encircled me, they have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Exactly what happened with Jesus as he hung on the cross. Written hundreds of years before. We have documents with this written down. Hundreds of years before Jesus died on the cross. In fact, this was written before they even invented crucifixion. As a means of execution. Does Jesus show up as the genuine Messiah? Does he walk through the gate? Does he do what he's supposed to do? as the prophesied saviour of the people of God. Who's among us here in John chapter 10? Genuine Jesus, authenticated saviour, he's among us. There are over 350 detailed clear points at which the life and ministry of Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies about the saviour and those things happened during his earthly life. And unlike those messianic pretenders of, of his era, or the ones who come along afterwards claiming to be the one, swinging their leg over the top of the wall and trying to jump into the sheep pen, Jesus just walks openly through the gate and the gatekeeper opens before him. John the Baptist swings the gate wide. I saw heaven open. I saw the Spirit descend on him like a dove. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the Tell you the truth, says Jesus in John chapter 10. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, and we've just seen he enters by the gate. 
but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. I'm the shepherd, says Jesus. And that's what he says before they misunderstand him, and he has to go on and explain. I'm the shepherd. The shepherd amongst you. The incarnate shepherd. The relevance of this being that he is the one who cares for the sheep. He's talking about his providential care, not his salvation care. He's talking about his providing for and looking after the flock of God. This is where Psalm 23 comes in, isn't it? Perhaps the greatest Old Testament exposition of the role of God as shepherd. <coughs> what characterizes the shepherd in verses 1 to 10 is authentic. He fits. He fits the requirement, the job spec. He fits the prophecy of God that's gone hundreds of years before. And the watchman opens up for him. And the sheep follow him out. That's the remarkable thing about Jesus, isn't it? Here he comes. He's come from a place that nobody rated. He, he hasn't done any of the things in his life that people rate. He comes along and people follow him. Very early in his ministry, there are 5,000 men plus followers in the wilderness of Judea listening to him preach all day long. So he's got to feed him at night, because Saints was his cause. We hear about him that the ordinary people hear him gladly. Draws a crowd. His word has an attractive power. And the sheep follow him. And when they're all out, he goes ahead of them in verse 4 of John 10. I am the shepherd. Jesus, the shepherd, providing for the flock of God.